It's a very, very great pleasure and an honor for me to be able to welcome back to SOAS, Professor Philip Cranbrook. <laughs> Professor Cranbrook was here between 1988 and 1996, and uh, I was very privileged to have been taught by him and indeed to have collaborated uh, with a very dear friend of both of ours, Mrs. Shanaz Munshi, on his book, Living Zoroastrianism, Parsis Speak Out About Their Religion. And I think this was one of the, certainly one of the first, um, one of the first works whereby oral testimony uh, was, has been, was used as a, as a means by which to study the religion. And I, I think of uh, Professor Cranbrook as a sort of pioneer um, of, of that particular methodology, which many of us have, have continued afterwards. And indeed, he's published widely on minority Iranian religions, particularly the Al-Haq and the Yazidis. So uh, I think I'm just going to turn over to him now. And uh, please join me in welcoming him again. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, indeed, Dr. Stewart. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start by congratulating the organizers of this exhibition, especially, of course, Dr. Stewart, but also Professor Williams and, uh, and Professor Hintzer, um, for uh, this uh, exhibition and this conference, and congratulate them on the, their success in carrying out the heroic task of realizing an enterprise like that, drawing attention to a religion to which, in my view, we may well owe the very concept of religion as we understand it in the West today. Zoroastrianism, it seems, may have been the first social movement in history to claim identity on the basis of adherence to beliefs rather than tribal or traditional adherence and practices. The individual is invited to join a community of men and women whose worldview, Daina, as Professor Hintz already uh, mentioned, whose worldview differentiates them from those around them. That is new, that is not known before that in the Indo-Iranian tradition, and I can't think of any tradition outside the Indo-Iranian area where such a community of believers would have existed. If one joined that group and pronounced a formal profession of faith, one belonged to what must originally have been a novel social category which later came to be called a deen, a religion, in our modern Western sense of the world, word. That is, of course, re that refers to ancient practice, to ancient ideas. It's nothing to do with modern um, ideas about conversion and so on. That is a matter for the Zoroastrians themselves to decide. But in the early days, we see Zoroastrianism maybe being the first religion in our sense. But that, as we shall see, is not all. This new worldview encompassed several other postulates that followers of the Abrahamic religions have come to take for granted, but without which their beliefs might not have developed as they did. And several of those key beliefs have to do with looking back. And that's what we're talking about. Uh, I call this return to the past, but I mean, of course, um, looking back. Then, Zoroastrianism then, as the late lamented Professor Mary Boyce often said, is worth studying. But then, what do we mean when we speak of Zoroastrianism? Once upon a time, the concept conjured up an image of a static, undifferentiated, and essentially unchanging system of beliefs and observances, which started with the prophet Zarathustra and essentially continues down to our day. Now, one can certainly think of Zoroastrianism in this way. It, it makes sense, but it does mean that one loses another perspective, namely that of development and change, which was probably as, as at least as significant for the history of Zoroastrianism as was continuity. One of the great questions facing the modern student of Zoroastrianism is precisely that of the balance between continuity and change in the long history of the Daina, which came into being be, um, because of the message of Zarathustra Spitama. This question is all the more intriguing because for approximately the first 2,000 years of its existence, that religion was transmitted by word of mouth in a context of laymen consulting priests 
who had undergone a rigorous training but could not fall back on a solid body of written exegesis. They couldn't consult books. They had to trust to their combination of, uh, of religious knowledge and their common sense of members of their own period in history. Both elements of continuity and development, ladies and gentlemen, can be aptly illustrated by examining the question of looking back. While the traditional Orientalist, informed by Christian or Islamic culture, may have expected Zoroastrians of all ages to have looked back first and foremost to the period of the founder of their faith, I hope to show to, uh, this afternoon that the reality was in fact more complex and more interesting. Of course, when one thinks about looking back in the context of religion, the question arises to what extent looking back is common to all religions. Religious teachings generally originate in the past, and most religions tend to look back in some ways. Still, a closer look shows that looking back can serve a, a range of different purposes, and each case needs to be examined individually. Some religions uh, look forward to an ideal future which represents the return to an ideal primeval time whose perfection was disrupted by a fall from grace which humanity must now strive to, to restore. You may recognize, recognize many forms of Christianity here, paradise and uh, the end of time, as well as Shiite Islam. This, looking back to the past as a blueprint for the future, is also found in several periods of the history of Zoroastrianism. But as we shall see, it's not the only reason the Zoroastrians had for looking back to the past. The past could also be seen as a time when religious knowledge was still intact and which therefore needs to be studied so as to help one define one's religion of the present. There again, different questions may be asked. One may wish to know about rules and laws and the workings of the church, so to speak, when the religion was still at its prime. One may have questions regarding the original teachings um, and the validity of religious leadership, wondering to what extent it's representative of the original teachings, which brings the whole question of religious authority into the equation. Alternatively, one may look for religious inspiration in the early teachings of the faith, which can be done either with a view to renewing one's current religion, uh, modernizing it, or in order to prove the orthodoxy of one's traditional beliefs. All those reasons for looking back can be found in the history of Zoroastrianism. Many, many groups have looked back, but their ideas of the past were as different as their motives for studying it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, the greatest looker-backer of all was probably the prophet Zarathustra himself. Zarathustra, who started out as a priest of a uh, perhaps somewhat conservative cattle-breeding community sometime around or before 1000 BCE, was forced by circumstances to look back. His community, it seems, had settled in a territory whose culture was dominated by a cognate people whose language and practices were comprehensible to Zarathustra and his followers, but seemed to them utterly misguided. Zarathustra's songs, or gathas, have long been thought of as being largely incomprehensible, or at least very mysterious, but a number of recent publications, including the work of Professor Hintze, shows that if we focus on what can be known rather than on the un unknowable, we can in fact infer a great deal of information from them. Zarathustra's community, we now realize, was involved in a very real conflict with members of a, a, a related culture who were more powerful than they, but whom they regarded, first of all, as deceitful, not righteous, and amongst whom there was, I quote, no decent life for the cattle breeder, end of quote, Yasna 29.5. Zarathustra, who was a highly trained priest, sought to understand this conflict in religious terms, and arrived at a number of very startling insights. Now, in order to understand Zarathustra's teaching, we do need to, to take into account that he lived not in 2013, but in a very different culture from ours. As has been very clearly shown by Kianush Rezanya, early Zoroastrianism clearly distinguishes between two times, as they call it, which I would call two concurrent modes of reality. One, called limited time, refers to our everyday reality with good alternating with bad, heat with cold, etc. That is, to the dynamic, ever-changing, time-bound um, reality we all experience. But underlying that mundane per perception of the world was unlimited time, 
or timeless time, as Rezanyar calls it, which represents a parallel, unchanging, absolute reality that's distinct from, but nevertheless plays a role in, our everyday affairs. One might compare the two to our actual uh, daily, daily personality, our daily life, on the one hand, and our soul to the other, the former being dynamic, changing all the time, and the latter, the soul, I expect being more or less unchanging. I don't know very much about the soul, but I think that's the idea. Um, absolute reality, remote though it is, could be accessed by an able priest, such as Zarathustra, who was thus capable of being in touch with absolute truth, or the divine, if you prefer. Now, my own re recent work on the Gatha suggests that this distinction between an unchanging archetypal mode of being and a mundane one was vital to Zarathustra's thinking and is the key, or is, is a key, to his interpretation of the reality of his day. By looking back to the traditions of his own people, he sought to understand how it was possible for a far from righteous group to dominate his own righteous followers and make life impossible for them. Now, Zarathustra, as you all know, connects this antagonistic state of affairs with the distinction between two groups of supernatural beings, the Daivas, who appear to have been as anthropomorphic, unpredictable, and self-willed as their Greek and Roman counterparts, the Theoi and Dei. These were gods whose attitudes inspired the morals and behaviors, behavior of Zarathustra's opponents. But Zarathustra's group, on the other hand, predominantly worshipped the so-called Ahuras, who, as I've argued elsewhere, were originally personifications of what we would call abstract concepts as well as natural phenomena such as the sun. All of these personifications were bound to the laws of truth or righteousness, Asha. And just as truth underlies all manifestations of what's good, absolute reality or timeless time has been present from pre-eternity, is present now in our time of trials and tribulations, and will still exist when the problems of life have been overcome and limited time will no longer play a role. Now Zarathustra, stressing the superiority of what one might call the moral ahuras over the self-willed divers, regarded all abstract qualities that could help the righteous as being embodied by good ahuric divine beings. Until then, some beings, like contract, had been personified, Mithra. But Zarathustra seems to call on all the qualities that he needs in his uh, struggle against evil. Um, these good Ahuric divine beings owed their origin to the greatest Ahura of all, Lord Wisdom, or Ahura Mazda. Furthermore, and that's very important, in order to play a role in this physical world, the qualities of those spiritual divinities had to be embodied, that is to say internalized, by human beings who opened themselves up to them. Only humans, it seems, could act freely in our physical world, and in the battle against evil, the divinities needed them as much as they needed divine inspiration and guidance. Now, ladies and gentlemen, in later Zoroastrian sources, there's absolutely no doubt that, Zara, um, that Ahura Mazda is a creator. But, as some of you know, Jean Kellens has argued, with some justification, that this does not appear to be the case in the Gathas. Ahura Mazda n'est pas un dieu créateur, which has provoked strong reactions among many students of Zoroastrianism, including some of those present here. Um, but my own work suggests that whenever the verb da, to create, titemi, is used for Ahura Mazda's creative activity, the, world, the word consistently refers to laying down the fundamental laws of existence, called data. Later, the word data came to, to, use, to, to be used for, for a law. In, but it could also be called a mantra, uh, a sacred word to bring something into being. could also refer the da to the creation of prototypes, such as the soul of the cow and the Amisha Spuntas, or, if you like, archangels, although that is an you know, always difficult. In other words, um, Ahura Mazda created beings that essentially belong to timeless time. And Ahura Mazda himself, moreover, as far as I can see, is not normally represented in the Gathas as intervening directly in the affairs of our time or reality. He belongs even more strictly in the, to the sphere of timeless time than the other divine beings which he created. Still, his laws or concepts 
may be actualized through these other divine beings who were capable in, of acting, in a sense, in our world, and who represent Ahura Mazda. Zarathustra's teaching clearly implies that before our time began, that is, in the, in the beginning, Pauruye, which I take to mean just that and nothing esoteric, in the beginning, the fundamental laws of existence were laid down by Ahura Mazda, and all was ideal for a brief time. Think of the Big Bang and the fact that the laws of nature were um, established in the, during the first second. Nothing to do with each other, but similar, maybe. Um, <clears throat> And at first, you know, everything was an ordeal, but um, Ahura Mazda's laws were just that, laws that can either be obeyed or ignored. Although the eternal structure is sound, in other words, it's up to human beings to realize its perfection, or not, as the case may be. Humans, of course, must understand these laws in order to be righteous and be part of the, of the, the world of righteousness and go to heaven and choose to follow them. The Daivas and their followers did neither, and Zarathustra's claim is that after the beginning, the world was damaged by the Daivas and their followers. Moreover, Zarathustra fears that these powers of evil may damage the world a second time in his day, and exhorts his own, exhorts his own a hurrah worshipping group to resist this, knowing that the ultimate reality to which the world must one day return is the one established by Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda in 20, Yasna 28.11 prays that Ahura Mazda may teach him the mantras, the sacred words, teachings or commands through which, quote, the world will be as it was at the beginning. End of quote. Now, what is so important in my view, ladies and gentlemen, is this, this, that this may well be the first time in the history of religion that con a consistent worldview was proposed implying that the world we live in is not as God or the source of existence wishes it to be, and that it's up to humans to embody the virtues represented by the holy beings who emanated from this source of existence and thereby to bring the world back into harmony with its fundamental laws of existence. Of course, we have Adam and Eve in Christianity and Judaism, but it's not quite as consistent and, and, and clear as in the Garthas if one reads them simply without interpreting too much. So, in other words, Zarathustra claimed that everything had been ideal in the beginning, but it was because of misguided divinities and their followers that it had lapsed into a state that was very different from the one intended by Ahura Mazda. Mazda himself was too holy to interfere directly, and the Garthas indicate that the divine beings who can help can only do so if their qualities are embodied by human followers. So, Zarathustra, if I'm right, was the first religious leader who came to the conclusion that we now take for granted, but without which, if you think about it, neither Christianity nor Islamic theology would make much sense. Instead of believing, as older religions often did, the world was as the gods had decreed, Zarathustra came to the conclusion it was not, and that the current conditions of our world are the result of, result of wicked misinterpretations of the truth and needed to be made whole again, which could only be achieved if humans lent the Ahuric beings their physical power. Men and women, in other words, needed to choose to embrace the diner proposed by Zarathustra. Zarathustra expected that an ideal existence would come into being when the forces of evil, in the form of the worshippers of the deceitful divas, had been overcome. That ideal state would mirror Zarathustra's idea of a, an ideal world in the beginning. And, as we shall see, the pattern of looking back so as to elucidate the future repeatedly played a role in the history of Zoroastrianism, as it does in many other religions. Now, Zarathustra's age must logically have been followed by a long period, if he lived around 1000 BCE, during which the founder's teachings gave rise to the formation of a religious community that, uniquely for early Indian and Iranian cultures, was able to spread, it could travel beyond the confines of a, fines of a single people or tribe. Since, as we find in Yasna 39.2, it accepted that believers, it, it would accept believers wherever they came from, provided they shared Zarathustra's diner. We have no accurate information as to what happened exactly during those dark centuries, 
but it's clear that many of the developments that characterize this period are reflected to some extent in what we call the young Avesta, that is, in the, te in the texts that continued to evolve as to language and contents, probably, in my view, until Achaemenid times in 500 BCE. So, what happened to the question of looking back? It's important to stress that Zarathustra's revelation appears to have been regarded by the Zoroastrian community as the only source of religious knowledge. He talked, Zarathustra talked to Ahura Mazda, and this is how the world can know anything. And that, in, in turn, gave rise to the belief that all knowledge had been revealed to Zarathustra. So the members of this newly developing religion expressed their joint veneration for Ahura Mazda and his prophet by looking back, on the one hand, to the time of creation, but also, and more particularly, to a time when Ahura Mazda taught Zarathustra the truth. The Confession of Faith says, as Ahura Mazda taught Zarathustra at all discussions, at all meetings at which Mazda and Zarathustra conversed, even as Zarathustra rejected the authorities of the Daiva, so I also reject as a Mazda worshipper and supporter of Zarathustra the authority of the Daivas, even if, as he, writes Zarathustra, rejected it. So the community started looking back perhaps more to Zarathustra than to the beginning, whereas Zarathustra looked back to the um, uh, period of creation. This goes on because um, as the period when Zarathustra was in contact with God receded into the remote past, one has the impression that expectations about the end of time came to be predicted further into the future. Legends developed about the events leading up to the end of time, which depict a sequence of events that was a mirror image of that of creation. Now, since Zarathustra played such a key role in communicating the truth to the world, it was apparently felt that he should also be prominently represented at the end of time. But the problem was that Zoroastrianism does not teach reincarnation and the resurrection of all the dead, which does occur, will occur, according to Zoroastrian mythology, but it was expected to take place when the process leading to the end of time was already well advanced. So Zarathustra could not play as a, a role as an initiator of those events. The solution that was found was to have implications for Christianity as well as Zoroastrianism. Um, a legend developed claiming that Zarathustra's seed was preserved in a lake and in the fullness of time a virgin would bathe there and give birth to a saviour who miraculously is Zarathustra's son. Later speculation came to believe that three such saviours would appear before the end of time, each at the end of a long period of decline. When the authors or transmitted of the young Avestan text looked, looked back, they still saw Zarathustra as a pivotal figure in the history of their religion. But curiously, this appears not to be the case in, Iranian, in the Iranian sources that reflect the next stage in the history of Zoroastrianism, that is, the Achaemenid inscriptions which begin under the reign of Darius I, 521 till 484 BCE. Now, when Darius and his successors the sovereigns of a new empire looked back, it was to the recent past, and not least to their own great exploits. I mean, just imagine, you're a king and you're not going to, to look at an ancient prophet, you look at your own deeds. Now, there are good grounds for the assumption that the Achaemenids were at least profoundly influenced by Zoroastrianism from the time of Darius I onward. We don't find a single mention of the prophet in the um, inscriptions. Pierre Br um, Briand, um, has drawn attention to a single seal, which Professor Cantera has just shown this morning, that is inscriptions in Aramaic script with a name which Briand and, uh, reads as Zarathustrish, and he may well be right. Um, but one seal, one swallow doesn't make a summer, one seal can hardly be taken as evidence of a strong tendency to look back to the time of the prophet. But, um, although the fact that there is no mention of Zarathustra uh, has led to many speculations that the earlier Achaemenids were not Zoroastrians at all, which, for reasons given elsewhere, I regard as untenable. But the true explanation may be that although Zoroastrianism became the religious of choice from the, for the Achaemenid elite and gradually for the people generally, the nobility was not overly preoccupied with the founder of their faith or with its earlier history. So, if we accept the earlier Achaemenids were indeed Zoroastrians or on the way of, uh, to becoming that, 
or strongly, um, does that mean that the founder of the religion was no longer felt to be relevant? Or was he just not very relevant to the majesty of the Achaemenid kings? Interestingly, we, when we look at the Greek sources, we find that Zarathustra's name in its, Greek, in its Greek version, Zoroastra, crops up for the first time in the works of two Greek authors of the 5th century BCE, that is precisely at the time when one would expect Zoroastrianism to have been in the process of becoming dominant in Western Iran, namely in the work of Xanthas of Lydia in the Lydiaca and of Plato in the first Alcibiades. Plato has the following to say about him. At 14 years of age, he, that is the king's son, is handed over to the royal schoolmasters, as they are termed. These are four chosen men, reputed to be the best among the Persians of a certain age, and one of them is the wisest, another the justest, a third the most temperate, and a fourth the most valiant. The first instructs him in the Magianism of Zoroaster, the son of Oromasus, who is, which is the worship of the gods, and teaches him also the duties of his royal office. Clearly, the Greeks can only have learned about this figure, Zoroaster, the son of Oromazus, from Iranians. They weren't clairvoyant, they, they can't have made it up. The fact that Zoroaster's name is mentioned in the works of two Greek authors of the 5th century BCE therefore strongly suggests, I would think, that the Persians' new preference for, Zoroaster, for the Zoroastrian tradition had generated a great deal of discourse about religion, and that Zarathustra did indeed play a key role there which in turn suggests that many ordinary believers were more interested in looking back to the early days of their religion than their royal masters. Now, Zarathustra stressed, as you all know, that a righteous person does not necessarily meet with success and happiness in this world. But that part of his teaching does not appear to have, uh, to have been taken on board by the Achaemenids, whose inscriptions state that they owe their position to Ahura Mazda because they were so righteous. That comfortable view of the world came to a, an abrupt end when Alexander the Accursed, perhaps known better to you as Alexander the Great, defeated the Achaemenid Empire. When the Zoroastrians looked back after the second half of the fourth century BE, they saw that a good period had given way to a bad one. Given that they'd always been taught that God had supported the Achaemenids because they, and obviously their religion, were so righteous, this new state of affairs needed an explanation. Zoroastrians, who believed that God rewarded the righteous, could hardly accept that God had switched allegiance from Zoroastrianism to Greek cults. An answer was found that involved a novel way of understanding the past, of looking back, if you like, which was to influence a range of other religions, notably Judaism, but others as well. This new view of history implies that, uh, his that history follows a preordained course and that good periods will inevitably be followed by a time of decline until things have become so bad that a saviour is needed to restore the world to a more or less ideal condition after which another period of decline can be expected to follow. Those preordained periods came to be thought of as lasting 1,000 years and these speculations gave rise to a view of history now known as millennialism, thinking in periods of, of a thousand years, which plays a role in several religions as well as Zoroastrianism. Such myths may have already existed in later Achaemenid times, but they appear to have acquired a particular significance after Alexander. According to Plutarch, uh, 45 to 125 CE, who cites Theopompus, 4th century BCE, the Magians believed that a series of periods of a thousand years would succeed each other in which the good and the evil gods would dominate alternately. In other words, here again, current religious problems were solved by proposing a different view of the past. At this stage, um, in the history of Zoroastrianism, ladies and gentlemen, I unfortunately have to skip two important periods, those of Alexander's successors, the Seleucids, and of the Parthians, because in spite of the very valuable efforts of Dr. Curtis, among others, uh, we still don't know enough about the Parthians to make any pronouncements. It seems likely that the Parthian successors, the Sasanians, did their best to make sure that nobody would look back to their immediate predecessors, the Parthians, but that's another matter. We're on firmer ground with the Sasanians, who ruled Iran from, I hope I'm right, to 124 um, until around 650 CE. To understand the development 
In their view of history, we need, a, need to consider a few points. Firstly, in a culture where the legitimacy of the king was regarded as a key consideration, the uh, Sasanians su uh, had succeeded to the throne through uh, a military victory, which in itself was not sufficient to warrant acceptance by the Iranian people. Now, the Sasanians and their councillors successfully solved this problem by means of a propaganda campaign based on two main points, both of which involved the construction of an appropriate view of the past. So, the Sasanians claimed to be the legitimate successors to um, the Achaemenids by inventing an improbable genealogy, which Professor Darioi uh, also um, uh, referred to, but it was apparently enough to satisfy the people not least because, after all, the, uh, the Sasanians held the power. And secondly, they presented themselves as the champions of true Zoroastrianism. And that's a new concept, arguing that owing to the incursion of Alexander, the ori original, true form of the religion had been lost, and only the Sasanians had the qualifications to restore the religion to its true form. That is, whereas in fact, everything points to the idea that a range of local Zoroastrian cults and of Zoroastrian beliefs must have existed at this, at this time, the Sasanian political and religious leadership looked back to a hypothetical, ideal period when a true form, the one true form of the religion existed, thereby introducing a new concept. A striking case, in other words, of interpreting the past according to the, the requirements of the present, and one that was to have far-reaching consequences because it led to the assumption that a true form of Zoroastrianism could indeed be re-established and some form of centralized authority was needed to achieve this. The Sasanians were good politicians, after all. The ideas in question can be found in the works of the, two, the first two great religious leaders of the time, Tansar and Kerder. The first of these, Tansar, simply claims that the Sasanians have absolute religious authority because they're so good. In combination with the physical fact that they were also so powerful, apparently that was enough uh, for his time. But his successor, Kerder, who was a dominant force in Iran in the third century CE, the question of religious authority was much more of a challenge, perhaps because two rival religions, Manichaeism and Christianity, raised their heads, claiming to be based upon direct divine revelations that had taken place recently enough for them to be able to look back to it. Kerder could not count this with a, with a similar claim for Zoroastrianism. He couldn't just say, oh, well, in Zarathustra's uh, revelation, it said so and so. In Sasanian times, it seems, Zarathustra had become a figure shrouded in leg legend and mystery, but the ultimate source of religious authority referred to in the Pahlavi books tends to be the ancient teachers, generally, Puryot Kishan, rather than Zarathustra. Definitely, neither Kerdir nor, nor Tansar explicitly refers to Zarathustra as a source of authority. The essential conditions for being a good Zoroastrianism um, were that one should be, according to the Pahlavi Vendidad, and that eri ud puryot kishi, which I would loosely translate as belong to Iranian culture and be a follower of the first teachers. However this, this may be, Kerdeir's own inscriptions imply that Kerdeir really thought that the ultimate authority in all practical questions of religion was his alone. He didn't suffer from an inferiority complex. Um, as Professor Darioi also said, I thought that I'd been the only one to think of this, but he did too, in order to prove that like the Christian and Manichaean authorities, he, had, uh, he too had some form of direct access to the divine, Kerdeir claimed that his alter ego had visited heaven and hell. This does not automatically make him a shaman, but the claim, I think, was in fact intended to underpin his religious authority by claiming direct knowledge of the divine. This question of the authority of the Zoroastrian leadership came up again during the reign of Shapur II, whom we've just seen in Professor Russell's uh, presentation and others, that is, a little after the time of Kerder, with the appearance of Adorbari Mahras Pandan, who, according to the tradition, underwent an ordeal by molten metal in order to prove his claims to religious authority. In other words, he needed to prove it. In later Sasanian Zoroastrianism, of course, Adorbad came to be regarded as one of the great authoritative figures um, next to the teachers of old, meaning that the culture 
no longer was no longer satisfied with the idea that um, that once upon a time there was Zarathustra and that's enough for all of us. They wanted some proof that what people were saying was based on actual experience of something divine. Later, again, a number of priestly lineages of schools, charged tag, emerged, each member of which claimed authority from the founder of his school. All this, as I said, suggests that in view of the strength and immediacy of rival claims to divine knowledge in Sasanian times, claims of looking back to Zarathustra were no longer felt to be adequate. The unspecific Puryot Kishan carried greater weight, and later there was a tendency to demand that religious leaders have some direct or indirect connection with the divine. The ordeal of Adurbadi Maraspandan and possibly Kereo's visit to heaven and hell became points of reference to which Zoroastrianism could look back in questions of religious authority. Of course, Zarathustra remained a legendary figure, the founder of the faith, who was known for his direct contact with Ahura Mazda. Myths developed about his life, which shows that, he, that Zoroastrians did indeed look back to the period of Zarathustra, but, uh, and he was the more or less mythical source of all religious authority and knowledge, but apparently no longer the primer, primary figure to look back to when it came to deciding actual questions in the field of religion. The problem of authority continued to haunt the Sasanians or Rastrians. And the next problem to crop up was the appearance of Mazdak, who died around 524, who challenged the status quo, apparently on the basis of his understanding of the true Zoroastrian teaching as reflected in the Middle Persian translation and exegesis of the Avesta, the Zand. His revolt, which at first enjoyed great popularity, was quashed, and as a result, Khosrow I banned the laity from studying the Zand. That blocked the road to a sense of empowerment in religious affairs among wide sections of the people and left the priesthood as the only body capable of looking back in search of religious authority. Among further relevant developments under the Sasanians is the increasing role that writing began to play. Writing, of course, affords a fundamentally different view of the past from that based on oral tradition. Since it became possible to consult contemporary sources for the past, objective historical truth slowly came to play a greater role in the Iranian's view of that past. One result of the increasing role of writing in Sasanian culture was that a need came to be felt for a written scripture. Interestingly, when this question was addressed, it was claimed that written versions of the Avesta had already existed in the past, that an ideal past had indeed existed until it was destroyed by Alexander the Accursed, who is, you know, um, guilty of a great many sins. There are good grounds for regarding this as a myth. Such claims clearly represent a tendency to legitimize new phenomena by claiming they had already existed in an earlier, better period. That means, incidentally, that when the later Sasanians look back to their past, their understanding of it must have differed considerably from that of their ancestors a few generations earlier. They believed in a past where a true form of Zoroastrianism had existed and where a written Avesta had also been available. All this would not have been known to Zoroastrians in early Sasanian times, I wouldn't have thought. Another important result of the increasing role of writing in Sasanian culture brought with it the desire to have a proper history of Iran, perhaps on the model of Greek histories. It's hard to um, overestimate the difficulty of achieving a profound transformation, the profound transformation that this required from a set of narratives that were transmitted orally and thus, in a sense, existed side by side, set in the same undifferentiated past, people now began to wonder how various traditions, heroic, religious, historical, associated with the past, could be fitted together so as to make something like a book. And a book is something, as you will know, that has a linear sequence with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Oral tradition does not. I mean, not in the same sense. That meant a very different way of looking back. Just imagine having to construct a linear history when all one has is, say, tales about Romeo and Juliet, Santa Claus, narratives from the Old Testament, and the history of the Tudors. How does one fit these various storylines into its linear sequence? Who came first, Romeo or Santa Claus? Still, 
Attempts to look back in a more historical, linear way evidently began to be made at some stage in the Sasanian period, and the results of these attempts were referred to, in my view, by the term Hwadoi Namag, books, Book of Kings, which I believe to have been originally a generic term for the whole range of such texts that tried to combine various uh, traditions, a genre rather than a single word text of Ferdowsi Shahnameh. However, the contents of the Hwadoi Namag continued to be regarded as part of the Iranian cultural heritage, an essential part, long after the Sasanian Empire had been defeated by the armies of Islam. And part of its culture, uh, contents eventually came to be included in a work that was to shape and determine the way Iranians look back to their pre-Islamic past, Ferdowsi Shahnameh. Ferdowsi's work integrated ancient Iranian traditions into Islamic Iranian culture, thus allowing the Iranians to look back to their past with pride, which probably played a key role in the development of a distinct Iranian Islamic identity, which in turn contributed to the emergence of other Islamic cultural identities, such as the Turkish or Indian ones. Now, we can only speculate, ladies and gentlemen, as to how much Ferdowsi Shahnameh itself meant for Zoroastrian communities at this early period. But there are good indications to show that Zoroastrians were familiar with many of the storylines found there. After the Arab conquest of Iran, the Zoroastrian community experienced uh, something um, akin to their ancestors' reaction to the time of Alexander. Millennialist, idea, millennialist ideas and other re legends that prophesied that this bitter period would come to an end and would be followed by a restoration of Zoroastrian dominance once more came to appear very meaningful. Speculations about the saviour figure Bahram of Azavand, which are alluded to in the Zandi Bahman Yast, seem to have become an important part of the living tradition of the community. Apart from that, after some two to two and a half centuries, um, the Zoroastrian priesthood had become aware of the difficulty of keeping religious knowledge alive as a living oral tradition. Instead, they proceeded to write down whatever they felt was most relevant in their traditional knowledge. When doing this on the whole, they only had time and opportunity to commit to writing some text that had formed part of a living and developing oral tradition, which was intended to be interpreted by a living dastur. Um, but they were unable uh, to develop this into a legal system, such as fiqh in Islam, of the type one normally finds in written cultures. It was a very, it, it, it was an oral tradition fixed in written form. That meant that in certain fields, their efforts to save the religious tradition resulted in the transformation of a living tradition that needed the personal input of a dastur into what appeared to be a fixed, somewhat archaic, and exclusive legalistic system. After Khosrow's reaction to the revolt of Mazdak, the laity never recovered its right to participate in religious debates as equals to the priesthood, which contributed to the difficulty of developing Zoroastrian teaching in a way that took current conditions into account. As the religion lost some of its sense of, uh, the, the official religion, I must say, lost some of its sense of actuality, an official religion focused mainly on questions of ritual and observance, looking back to an imagined ideal past may well have become all the more important for the Zoroastrian community, but it did not have a voice at the time. We don't know exactly when the Parsis emigrated, or indeed how this migration took place, but since there were an Iranian community in a new land, Iran obviously became an ideal they looked back to with veneration, also in the form of having an, a sacred fire that came from Iran. <coughs> At a later stage, from the 15th till the 18th century, leaders of the Iranian and Indian communities corresponded, and their correspondence, Ruvayats, gives us some insight into, I wonder what, into what? Oh yes, the preoccupations of the priesthood, sorry. Um, the knowledge those priests discussed was still of the same kind of that as that of the Pahlavi books, questions of ritual and observance. Essentially then, these priests sought to look back at the religious knowledge of their Sasanian and early post-Sasanian ancestors without much reference to earlier or later times. But from the 16th century onwards, we hear of, a new, of new religious movements in which Zoroastrianism played a role such as the school of Azar, Azar Kevan, 
who lived around from 1530 to 1618 CE, an Iranian who migrated to India during the time of the Emperor Akbar and became the founder of a school which Corbin calls a representative of Zoroastrian, Zoroastrian Ishraq, or Illuminative Philosophy, and which, he says, quote, helped produce a sort of philosophical and mystical revival in the Zoroastrian milieu. I know that we shall hear more about Azar Kavan tomorrow, and I can't really judge uh, Corbin's claims, but it wouldn't be surprising to find that in the heady climate of Akbar's religious policies, some Zoroastrians became interested in the teachings rather than rituals of their faith. Later, we see the appearance in India of other figures who claim divine inspiration for a new interpretation of Zoroastrian teaching, such as Bahram Shah Shroff, the founder of the Ilmik Shnum, and Nasrbanji Pundol. Now, one way of explaining this parallel development in Zoroastrians' perceptions of their religion would be simply to say that the cultural environment the Parsis lived in from the 16th century onwards led some of them to seek new horizons. One might also put it another way and say that the appearance of new religious teachers afforded those who needed it an opportunity of finding a more refer recent reference point to look back to. In fact, when we examine the spectrum of modern tendencies in Parsi Zoroastrianism, we notice that, conditioned by their present perceptions of what the religion is or should be, various sections of the community are looking back to different kinds of, of the past, to different forms of the past. For instance, there's what's usually called the Orthodox community, who focus on the tradition as a whole and implicitly regard their dastus as the legitimate representatives of a spiritual lineage that began with Zarathustra. Others, prompted perhaps by a more Christian concept of religion, feel that the essence of a faith lies in its teaching and aim to look back at Zarathustra's original message alone, rejecting the evidence of later sources as more or less irrelevant. Some occultist groups, one might say, believe that the past is still with us in a mysterious way and its representatives may materialize and guide the faithful as they did apparently in the uh, case of Behran Ram Shah Shroff. Although a great veneration of the, for the prophet Zarathustra is common to all or most groups, and myths and le legends are told about him, the fact that this historical figure is shrouded in the mists of the remote past has clearly given rise in some quarters to the need to look back to more recent authority figures. In Iran, the Pahlavi dynasty represented the Iranian people with an ideal image of the pre-Islamic past in which Zoroastrianism played an important role. And for many Iranians, that religion still symbolizes their cultural independence and identity. This clearly affected the Zoroastrian community and helped it emancipate in a certain way. I have not enough um, evidence uh, to attempt to sketch how the cultural climate of the Pahlavi dynasty and that of the Islamic Republic affected the Iranian Zoroastrians, and we're all waiting for Dr. Sarah Stewart to publish her much-needed material on that subject, so I'll, uh, I won't try to touch it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming uh, to uh, an end. You'll be relieved to hear. We've been looking back at the ways the Zoroastrians look back. Now, if we look back ourselves, what do we owe? What is important to us as Westerners? I mean, I, I take it we're all Westerners at the moment here. Um, I think, as I said, that Zarathustra founded the first, well, you know, that, that came up with something that developed in what we would call a religion, as opposed to a tribal cult or whatever. I think he offered the world a coherent worldview that implied that the world is not as God intended it to be and made it stick, made it coherent, which is a ma major thing. Zoroastrianism so gave us the idea of heaven and hell, reincarn um, um, the um, um, rebirth, I mean, the, the, the fact that um, people will rise again at the end of time, and of a savior born of a virgin. Zoroastrianism clearly contributed considerably to millennialist ideas, and as we all know, Zoroaster became an object of speculation for the Greeks and for many later thinkers in Europe. F finally, when we think of the achievements of the Achaemenids, the Sasanians, and the Parsis, we can say that Zoroastrianism has offered us a, f a view of the lofty ideals a religion can inspire in its followers. <laughs> 
That religion, in short, has given its followers and the world at large a great deal. May it live long. Thank you. Professor Cronenbroek, thank you for a fascinating lecture and for addressing the theme of our conference so succinctly with reference to the figure of Zarathustra and his teachings. So from the idea of, of the two times and the major innovation of Zarathustra, namely that the world has not, has, has not uh, as God would have wished it to be, and that it is, it is up to human beings to restore it to its former perfect state, we've been taken through the entirety of the history of imperial Iran, the post-Arab conquest, and the various ways in which Iranians have engaged with the past in order to preserve the authority of the teachings of their prophet. Uh, ending with the Parsis in India, this has been a real tour de force, and thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you.